Eve ruling. The action was inconsistent with Article 72 or 71 of the 1992 Constitution. We got details of the ruling plus subjected to some analysis. The highest court, meanwhile, has also declared as null and void the imposition of restrictions acts as passed in Parliament in 2020. Also this afternoon, political scientist with the University of Ghana, Professor Ransford Jampo, questions the basis of President's directive to have senior officers of the Electoral Commission submit their CVs to his office. I do not understand why the president who didn't appoint the directors of the Electoral Commission who want to have access to their CVs. What for? We hear more from him as he also requests that the directive be withdrawn as he labels the president the worst in protecting the freedoms of independent bodies. And much later, minority raises red flags over defense of national ambulance service on a World Bank sponsored ambulance for the country. Details of these and a lot more if you stay with us for the next 30 minutes. A pleasure that you could be a part of this afternoon's bulletin. It's streaming live on Facebook. Our handles 3FM927. Same as Twitter, 3FM927. I am Eric Mawina Egbeta. Let's get into the details this afternoon because the Supreme Court has declared as null and void President Ekufuado's directive to former Auditor General Daniel Yaudomelevu to compulsorily proceed on leave. President Tekufuado in June 2020 directed the then Auditor General to proceed on his mandatory accumulated leave. That decision subsequently evolved into the sacking of Mr. Domelevo, a situation which was subsequently challenged by nine civil society groups at the Apex Court. Well, two years after that challenge, the Apex Court today ruled that the decision by the President was unconstitutional. Let's just walk you through the reliefs as was sought by the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana, the Ghana Integrity Initiative, the Citizen Ghana Movement, Africa Center for Energy Policy, and Parliamentary Network Africa, amongst others, Pen Plus Bytes, the Media Foundation for West Africa, and Sen Ghana, as well as the One Ghana Movement. And so the reliefs that were sought by the groups included a declaration that on a true and proper interpretation of articles 71b and 71 1 187.3 5 7a 8 12 and 13 and article 297a of the 1992 constitution the directives issued by or on behalf of the president on between the 29th of june 2020 and the 3rd of july instructing the Auditor General to proceed on accumulated leave with effect from the 1st of July 2020 was for a prescribed number of days determined by the President are void and of no legal effect because the said directives are inconsistent with the letter and the spirit of the aforementioned provisions of the Constitution and they improperly interfere with the independent and functions of the auditor general that was the first of the many reliefs that was so let's subject it to some further analysis christian mom health hesse is a private legal practitioner he's joined us on phone for a conversation many thanks counsel for speaking to us this afternoon so a declaration uh the decision has been uh, affirmed by the supreme court as null and void many say that this is not surprising even when you look at the development from its face value as far back as 2020. Yes, um, good afternoon to you and your listeners, Maina. Yes, I mean, um, it is very evident that um, from the face of the relief sought uh, vis-a-vis the constitutional provisions that they were leased to showed or pointed that everything in law was looking at the success of the the uh, the auditor general in court because if you look at um, the reliefs um, conjunctively particularly looking at um, the articles canvas that um, article 71 um, which deals with um, basically emolument and uh, uh, so the, they, they start to look at everything as a whole. So a 
agreements and all of those things were dealt by president acting in consultation with um, what you call it, the Council of State. When it also um, comes up to the appointment of Attorney General, which mm. is um, very seated with Article 187, it also follows that line in consultation for the appointment. Now, upon the appointment of the Attorney General, the Constitution gives the Attorney General a power vested um, legal right that um, cannot be interfered by the appointing officer um, such or officers, such that it, it further indicates that um, the Attorney General cannot be controlled by any person or authority. So it matters whether or not it's coming from the president or parliament or, or any governmental institution. Mm. The, the jurisprudence behind that is, is laid down in the functions of the Attorney General such that if another institution or individual person, whether artificial or natural, is able to coerce or bend or control the hands of the office of the attorney general, um, of the auditor general, mm. then it would traverse the kind of work that um, that particular office is supposed to do in respect of um, reconciling accounts for the country as a whole. Mm. So further on, if you also look at um, the 12, and that um, uh, one eight seven twelve. it further goes on to say that the right, you know, because the, the, the whole the whole purpose was to nullify or, or seek to say that um, the leave that was forced on Attorney General was null and void. You the, know, the, the Auditor General. Holds it that, yeah, the Constitution holds it that um, those, those, those prerogatives should be should be left with the office of the attorney general mm, to deal with them. Right. Because um, the, the 12 indicates that if a external body seeks to force the, the uh, auditor general to to go on leave, would would be presupposed to mean that you are disadvantaging or seeking mm. to have that done for your own benefit. Right, right. If you look at the circumstances that happened, mm. it meant that... Um, Article 1874 was very uh, 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 contrary, was very really acted contrary mm. to the spirit mm. and lack of the Constitution. Right. So, all, all well and good, but it, it appears that from the explanations you continue to offer on the face value, it was really easy for the Supreme Court to arrive at this decision. Then there's the concern from some members of the public as to the length of time it had to take the highest court of the land to make these pronouncements on what now has been clearly defined as an unconstitutionality. What possible justifications could there be for what some have described as an over delay in arriving at such simple conclusion? Um, with with that one, I will leave it to the APS court, uh, as I cannot necessarily. Uh, determine what caused the delay in 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 arriving at that conclusion. I mean, as the effect is that the Auditor General currently is retired, and even though this case is won uh, on basis of legal principle, in reality, um, the Auditor General, once he's retired, cannot benefit from it, but it seeks to point for mm. is a win for rule of law. Right. That is how I see it in the legal fraternity. Mm. Just finally, if there could be consequential orders following this decision, we know that the full judgment is not just out just as yet, but forcing a man to proceed on leave and the, and the court deciding that it was unconstitutional. Could there be other consequential orders uh, um, arising from this? So with that one, again, I would recuse myself from that and say that it clearly, it clearly is in the ambit of the Supreme Court to determine the consequential of this because I cannot arrogate mm. those vested or constitutional powers to myself as that would be consequential of myself. <laughs> right, right, then. Uh, duly, duly understood. That's Christian Mom Hesse. He's a private legal practitioner. Uh,
Vitus Azim is an anti-graft campaigner as well. Let's just pick quick thoughts from him as to this decision has arrived by. Many thanks uh, for speaking to us. For you in the anti-graft campaign, this would come as vindication for you because you raised the concern that the president shouldn't have asked the Auditor General then to proceed on a mandatory leave. Yes, it, 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 it's, a, it's a vindication of our stance. And it's welcome news. It, it means that to us, all is not lost. That we can resort to the highest court of the land for, for justice. And that justice has today been done to Mr. Domolovo, but not only to Mr. Domolovo as a person, but to the status of independent institutions in this country. That the executive cannot just wake up one night and uh, order them to do what they want. That works against, especially our fight against corruption in the country. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really happy that this decision has come on. Some would say that the decision already damages the reputation of the president. How much damage could this have on a man who continues to make the claim that his administration has fought graft best? Well, that damage was already done, and this ruling has only just confirmed his, uh, his authoritarian way of doing things, especially when it comes to dealing with uh, corruption. And so, in any case, he has not at stake because he's not going to contest elections again. So it doesn't actually, he wouldn't feel anything about it. And I don't think that they will be in a position to, to, to appeal this uh, ruling. So, yes, it has it's a dent on the image of the government, and especially the acclaim we fighting corruption. But uh, personally, I don't think that the president will have any feeling about it. What possibly could happen to the current Auditor General? In your thoughts? Uh, I think that uh, maybe there will be some negotiations, and Mr. Donald will be paid his salary and entitlement up to the time that he was supposed to go on retirement. And then he will or, or, or maybe either go on retirement or resign since mm -hmm. he already moved on. And then a decision will be taken as to whether to confirm the current acting auditor general or to appoint another person. Right. I'm certain that the has cleared the, 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 the scene legally. Right, then. I appreciate that you could speak to us this afternoon. You're welcome. That's Vitus Azim. He's an anti-graft campaigner speaking to us this afternoon. And the Supreme Court, away from uh, that case on Domelevu, has in a unanimous decision as well declared as unconstitutional the law that allowed government to impose restrictions during the COVID-19 pandemic. Parliament, uh, as you'd recall, in 2020 passed the imposition of restrictions acts to allow restrictions provided for in Article 21 of Ghana's 1992 constitution to be imposed and the set constitutional provisions allow restrictions to be put in place in the interests of defense, public safety, public health, or the running of essential services on the movement of residents within Ghana of any person or persons generally or any class of persons. Away from this, but staying on the president and decisions he's been taking and political science lecturer with the university of ghana professor ranitsford jampo has described as unnecessary and undemocratic a request by the president to have directors of the electoral commission submit their cvs to his office an internal memo by the electoral commission addressed to staff taxed all directors and other superiors to submit their cvs to the president as part of a request made to all state-owned enterprises but reacting to the development, Professor Jampo questioned the basis of the request, further demanding the EC be left alone by the president. I do not understand why the president, who didn't appoint the directors of the Electoral Commission, who want to have access to their CVs. What for? I mean, this is an independent commission. And so the independent commission must have a way of going about its activities. Mm. Uh, and if it's a matter of their CVs, they have their, their own HR units that handle some of these things. And so I do not see why the executive president would demand or order for their CVs. Or what? Is it for their reappointment 
So I, I just do not understand. And especially given that um, the executive president is seen to be playing a certain role in compromising the independence of the electoral committee. That's Professor of Political Science, Ransford Jampo. Let's just pick quick thoughts. Dr. Frederick Kudrow is a governance expert and the dean of the Institute of Local Government. Many thanks, Doc, for speaking to us. What possible constitutional rights can the president be expressing in demanding this of the Electoral Commission? Well, um, I, I wouldn't know. For, for a start, I, we need to establish clearly, even indeed it was the president that requested for the information. But constitutionally speaking, the management staff of the, of the electoral commission are appointed by the Public Services Commission. However, under Article 17, these, these, uh, the, 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 the first key management staff in most public institutions are appointed under the authority of the presidency because that's how the constitution has been uh, crafted. But okay. I'll be surprised that the presidency itself will request for the uh, CVs of the, of, the, of the management staff, if not the Public Services Commission. It is the Public Services Commission that would ordinarily be expected to be doing that. So it would be a bit bizarre on my, uh, for me, if indeed it's the presidency asking for the CV. And for the purpose they are going to use the CVs, only heavens knows. But mm. I, I find it quite a strange uh, uh, request if it is indeed coming from the presidency. Mm. But I would have expected that the Public Services Commission, which is responsible for their promotions and all that stuff, the appointment promotions, would uh, necessarily or could be asking for such information. But I don't know what the presidency would be needing that. So we need clarity from both the EC and perhaps from the president mm. that indeed such a request has been made and the purpose for which they made that request. Right then, Doc, I appreciate that you could speak to us. But the Electoral Commission, just to add, says that they will issue a statement later this afternoon to clarify the position. So as and when they do issue that statement, we'll come back to you for a bit more on this. I appreciate that you could speak to us. That's Dr. Frederick Odrew. He's a governance expert and the dean at the Institute of Local Government. Now, the minorities raising red flags over the defense of the National Ambulance Service on a World Bank-sponsored ambulance for the country. Social media media went agog after a citizen vigilante filmed the said ambulance in Dubai displayed at a private garage for sale with the endorsement of the Ministry of Health and Funding from the World Bank on it. In a statement, the National Ambulance Service described the claims as completely false, adding that the vehicle in question is one of 26 Toyota Hiace ambulances being procured by the government through the Ministry of Health and funded by the World Bank. According to the service, the said ambulance was found on the premises of the company which is manufacturing the ambulances, adding, it is therefore not true that the ambulance is there for sale. Joining us in studio is the ranking member on the Health Committee of Parliament, Kwabnaminta Kando. Many thanks, Honorable, for joining us in studio. So, first off, the explanation as provided by the ambulance service, you say, is not satisfactory. Why is it not? Well, when I first and foremost, let me say good afternoon to listeners and viewers and say that um, the Ghana National Ambulance has no locals in this matter. Mm. If you read the Auditor General's report, the contracting party here is Republic of Ghana being represented by the Ministry of Health. So if anything at all, we're expecting the Ministry of Health to come and respond to this matter. In any case, the response by the Ghana Ambulance Service also is a, a very horror one, mm. okay? And it's quite interesting how things are unfolding because if you could recall, in the Auditor General's report, as per the COVID expenditure, um, a contract was signed and about 26 ambulances were supposed to be delivered in January 2022, if you recall. And then the recommendations by the Auditor General was that an extension be given and that extension should not be should not go beyond march 2023 may is ending today as we speak not a single one of the ambulances has been delivered 
So the substantive issue here is that where are the ambulances? Where are the ambulances? And why is the Ministry of Health not responding to the issue? So they don't add up. They don't simply add up. Okay, and so I feel that there are more questions than answers that has been provided. And we as leaders of this country mm. are accountable to the good people of the, this country. So when a matter attain the public interest status, we must be seen responding to the issue and clarifying and to clarify the issues. If you watch the video, to the extent that the citizen vigilante was able to negotiate and a price was given, because if you listen to the Ghana Ambulance Service and some of the explanations that has been given, that is a sample, of course, the, the garage has also come out to issue a press statement. Mm. It's a sample of the 26 ambulances that are supposed to be given that has been displayed in the garage. Why must a sample be displayed? It's an order that the country has made. Why must a sample be displayed at a garage that a price must even be put to it? In any case, even if a similar ambulance is supposed to be sold, it must not be in a branded form. So there are a lot of questions to be answered than the answers provided so far. Mm. So I think that the most substantive issue here is that it is never in the domain of Ghana. It hasn't got into the domain of the Ghana Ambulance, ambulance Services service. in the first place because we have not taken delivery and we've not handed over the ambulances to the Ghana uh, 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 Ambulance Service mm. in the first place. And the second issue is that where are the ambulances? To the extent that more than six hundred thousand dollars have been paid to the company to the supplier and not a single one has been delivered mm -hmm. where are the ambulances considering that the auditor general has had raised this and even uh, asked that the delivery of the ambulances do not go beyond march 2023 what actions will the minority in parliament so you know as you know i mean this issue has attained public interest I mean, uh, 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 level, mm. and we have to respond to the issues, but then we are on recess. So we'll follow the matter to its logical conclusion. A question will be filed, we'll write to the appropriate quarters, and we'll make sure, and take it from me, we'll make sure even if we have to travel to inspect the ambulances from the supplier's end, we'll do so. And then make sure that the 26 ambulances have been supplied and Ghana has not been shortchanged. Right, Sir Nanobu. But on, on the health ministry, you say that they should be responding to these claims and not the ambulance services. Yes, because what the ambulance services have provided is very hollow and there is no substance in it. In any case, I will not blame them because they are not a contracting party. The contracting party here is a ministry of health. So they should be seen speaking. Why haven't they taken delivery of these ambulances? Right. So people should not be setting their own questions and be seen answering their questions. It's a, it's a very legitimate matter. It's a very legitimate matter that we have signed a contract of more than $4 million. We've made a commitment. We've, we've exceeded or we've gone beyond the deadlines and we haven't taken delivery of the ambulances. I, I don't know legitimate issues. Right then. Uh, Honourable, I appreciate that you could come by our You're studios. Welcome. That's the ranking member on the Health Committee of Parliament, Kwabna Minta Kando, speaking to us this afternoon here on the Midday News on 3FM 92.7. It's streaming live on Facebook as well as on Twitter. Same handles, 3FM 927. We'll do some other matters because business owners at Medina Ritz Junction have been counting their losses after fire swept through dozens of shops and kiosks last night. The fire, which reportedly started around 10.30 p.m., took uh, fire person about five hours to douse this is the second time properties at the place have been raised down by fire this year no investigations into the incident are yet to conclude the ghana national fire service has not ruled out an arson as a probable cause alex Nete is public relations officer for the ghana national fire service Stop, stop, stop. Our men at uh, Madiba were um, alerted about the fire here, and the, the, the good thing is that our station is very close to this area, okay. so within one minute our crew have um, arrived here. As of now, we have about five fire tenders here at the scene. Okay. Uh, station at Madina was the first to attend to the scene, and then we called on the University of Ghana to complement the efforts, then the station from Adenta, then uh, Abilene joined in, then 
the national headquarters. It's been a tough uh, job for us, especially being able to break through. At this point, we can confidently say that the fire, there's no risk of the fire spreading or the fire getting out of hand. Mm. The fire is under control, but not extinguished, mm. meaning that we are on top of our game. The yes. court has not yet been established yet. Yes. Um, and it's unfortunate that this is the first time we are attending to a fire situation here at um, um, this area. And we always encourage the people here that our, our station is very close by. They should give a listening here to our safety department when they come here to give education. Alex Nerti is a public relations officer of the Ghana National Fire Service and there'll be a lot more on this if you stay with us here on 3FM 92.7. We're taking you to the governing new patriotic party's headquarters because they say that they are poised to win the upcoming by-election in the Asin North constituency of the central region. Both the NPP and the NDC have been lacing their boots ahead of the yet-to-be-announced date for the by-election in the Asin North constituency. He follows the official declaration of the seat as vacant by the clerk to parliament in a letter to the Electoral Commission. Commissioners of the EC following that letter They've been meeting to propose a date to organize the by-election, but even before the EC would announce a date, the governor New Patriotic Party they've slated June 7 to organize a primary for its members with aspirant picking forms, nomination forms today. National Youth Organizer of the NPP, Abdul Salam, has been addressing the news conference where he says that the party will snatch the seat from the NDC. My colleague Stanley Blow is at that news conference who join us on the phone uh, pretty shortly. Uh, with some details as to exactly what has been said there by your listening uh, to the news here on 3FM 92.7. We can hear, meanwhile, though, from the Director of Ele Legal Affairs of the NDC, Abraham Amaliba, who has been speaking to us in relation to the development as the clerk to Parliament wrote to the Electoral Commission declaring that the Asin North seat was vacant. Any time from now, I am saying that the process is filed by, or the process is begun by the EC and the uh, Parliament would have to hold until the determination of the application for review. If the, if the lawyers come to a firm decision that they want to review, I think that consult, they have to do, there must be a consultation with the party on this. That's Abraham Amalaba, he's Director of Legal Affairs of the NDC. As and when we're able to get Stanley Blow on the telephone lines, we'll bring you a lot more thoughts. But we're taking you to Obwasi now because Calm appears to have returned to Obwasi after the youth took over the Obwasi Central Police Station and the Obwasi East District Assembly yesterday. Yeah, it had to take the military to intervene uh, following what has been widely reported as over 100 individuals who were held up in the mine, mining pit of Anglo Gold Ashanti for fear of being arrested. Over 48 of them came out of the mine pit yesterday and were arrested, which prompted the youth to besiege the district assembly officers and the police officers, demanding that the said individuals who'd been arrested be released. My colleague, Ibrahim Abubakar, he's been there all throughout yesterday. He's been providing some details uh, for us. It'll be interesting to find out if all of the miners now have made their way out of the mining pit of Anglo Gold uh, Ashanti and whether or not the demand by the U to have these individuals released um, have been approved by authorities of the company. But in other matters, government's drive to revive tourism in the country will see no gains if residents of tourist sites do not benefit from the resources. That's according to the country's chief of staff, Fremor Sayapari. She's called for an immediate feasible collaboration between industry players and locals to promote tourism, which was speaking on the second day of the presidential summit on tourism. We can hear from the chief of staff. The time to celebrate and promote our diverse traditions and cultural practices is now. As we look into the future of sustainable tourism development in Ghana, as we are aware, Ghana is the home of diverse ethnicities, each with its unique customs, languages, and artistic expressions. By showcasing the beauty and the authenticity of our cultural heritage, we stand 
to create long-lasting experiences for tourists and foster a sense of pride among our own people. Ladies and gentlemen, as from our sale parish, she is the chief of staff ending this afternoon's edition of the news here on 3FM 92.7. As always, a lot more news if you log on to 3news.com. The business team, they are on standby to bring us the very latest from the world of business. I am Eric Mawina Egbeta. Very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us on Business Daily. This afternoon, my name is Nana Ikuya Mensa Abrampa. Coming up this afternoon, the city is projected to end the month with a 5.3% gain, the fourth biggest of about 150 currencies tracked by Bloomberg. And market analysts say Ghana would require more Forex to close the balance of payment uh, before recording currency stability as city continues to tumble. We have the details of this and more in the next 10 minutes. Please stay. Thank you for your time. Now, Ghana's city is poised to end May with a 53 percent advance, the fourth biggest of about 150 currencies tracked by Bloomberg. This is attributed to the $3 billion deal. That is a $3 billion deal Ghana has secured with the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. My colleague, Menu Afo, has been following up on this one. She has the reports. The Ghana city has been well positioned to end this month among the top performing currencies globally because of the $3 billion deal with the IMF, according to Bloomberg. Well, this report, however, comes despite earlier predictions by market watchers and experts that the city was going to experience a rather dire performance despite securing an IMF deal. IMF is estimating our balance of payment needs between now and 2026 at around um, $15 billion, really. And IMF's funding, the entire $3 billion, is just about 20% of that $15 billion. And so we will need a lot more to be able to close the balance of payment gap and restore stability on the market. Now, the expectation is that Ghana's finances will be strengthened by the IMF program so that the country can gradually restore enough confidence and stability to regain access to global markets. Menu Afo, 3 Business, Accra. Menu Afo with that report. Now, energy analyst Kujo Nsafuapoku says the only way to address the energy sector legacy debt is to stop the recurring trend. And he noted that the growing debt in the energy sector will cripple the economy. We spoke to him earlier. Get rid of the legacy debt. And when you get rid of the legacy debt, what do you do? Stop the debt reoccurring. Today, we are saying that, look, we need to restructure the IPP indebtedness. We've said that you cannot let the energy sector indebtedness grow. Mr. Amewu, when he was minister, brought out a document to say that we need to reform. Go and read that document. He talked exactly about what the IMF is saying. The trajectory where the energy sector dependence is going will cripple the economy. We have not done that. So if you now need to fix the energy sector, stop the debt from reoccurring. Increase your upstream, which is the crude oil, okay? Then you get the windfall. Then you pay all your bills. The MPP presidential race hopeful, Kojo in Safuapoku, said realistic tariffs should be set decoupled from politics. Let us pay realistic price for electricity, which is not very popular, okay? 
PLC does their review regardless, okay? So PLC setting realistic target for review of electricity is the right thing to do. They use 12.7, which is the right rate to use. In the past, when it's 12, they are using 10. When it's 10, they are using 7. It's wrong. So we have now pushed the PLC to set the right. When the gas price went up by 6.8%, in the past, PLC would not have factored that in. But in this review, they factored the um, gas price up by 6.8%. That is the right thing. When we've now been able to now claw back that debt, if tomorrow the city to the dollar comes to 10 cities, what will happen? Ghanaians will get a reduction in electricity because we used 12 in the last review. That is the right way to do. But let's not, not be making it look like, oh, we can't increase electricity because of politics. It's wrong. And that was energy analyst Kujo Insafwa Poku there. Now, concerns arise among telecommunication stakeholders as the National Communication Authority, the NCA, is set to deactivate unregistered SIM cards in less than 24 hours with over 9 million SIM cards at risk after today's deadline. The sector faces potential repercussions. MTN Ghana CEO Seloma Dadivo emphasized the importance of customers registering their SIM cards with a Ghana card within the given grace period, which is less than 24 hours, urging them to take immediate action. We're very concerned. As a business, 9 million SIMs in the industry is a, it's a large amount of SIMs. And, you know, we continue to work with customers and intensify our activities in the field to try to get people to register. But the main concern is the apathy and perhaps the, the lack of responsiveness of customers despite a lot of effort to get people to come to register. We saw a lot of our stores and service centers quite busy yesterday with a lot of queues. And the question is, I mean, why does it take to the last few days before people respond? And yeah, I mean, that's the main concern. But, you know, as a business, we're committed. We understand and support the National SIM Registration Program. And we've put a lot of resources behind the team to try to ensure that we get everyone registered to the extent possible. But we need customers to do their part. And between now and the deadline, if you have not registered a SIM, please go and do that. And that was the Chief Executive Officer, Seloma Dadivo, MTN Ghana, there. And rightly said, the telecoms chamber is also saying that if you do not register your SIM card in less than 24 hours starting from now, you are likely to also lose your mobile money on any of the networks or accounts you're holding. And it will take you through a cumbersome process to retrieve your money if you are to register your card after this deadline they have given. So if you are listening and you haven't registered your card, you have less than 24 hours to do so or face the implications. But away from that, the Chief Operations Officer, of the Ghana Commodity Exchange, Robert Dona O has stressed the need for a collaborative effort to tackle the numerous challenges bedeviling the cashew industry. Addressing the media after a stakeholder engagement, he called for a structured market as a means to boost the production and sales of the commodity. The under a structured market, you have other rules that are used to operate. In a structured market, farmers and buyers can be assured of the quality of the commodities in which they are buying. Now, because the structured market too, and people are buying from one location or the other, there's efficient use of logistics, and you can actually plan your logistic um, cost much easier because you're operating within a structured space. When it comes to the pricing, because the structured market, the forces of demand and supply, you come into play for price discovery, and so you're able to get better prices for the commodities that you have um, because again it's a structured marketing system or structured trading system you are assured of your commodities being stored under hygienic conditions you are sure of making um, your commodities that you bring to the warehouse you're getting payment for exactly what it is that you brought to the warehouse under the electronic management system and that was the chief operations officer of the Ghana Commodity Exchange, Robert Dona, all there. Just before we go, government is hoping to raise over 2 billion cities this week on the Treasury market despite failure to meet its targets last week. This will be done across the 91 and 182 day bills to refinance maturing bills worth almost 2 billion cities. This is much lower than the 3.4 billion cities target the government was hoping to raise last week. 
Market analysts are, however, hopeful the government will this time exceed its targets, but there are fears interest rates could remain high due to negative investor sentiment. And following the receipt of the first tranche of the IMF funds, investor confidence is expected to pick up in the coming months. We'll be monitoring the treasury bill markets to give you more updates. But remember, you can also log on to 3news.com. We have more business news up there. Black Rasta will join us shortly. And uh, that's it for business. Do enjoy your lunch and have a good day. My name is Nana Ikuya Mensa Abrampa.